Hello, and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at KillerQueensPodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, and we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge, and let's talk about some true crime. I, like, I don't know what to do with my hands. And I, I, I know it's not important right now, but, like, I was, like, I tried to, like, put them on that. And then I'm, like, no, and I'm trying to put them. I can't. <laughs> I don't know. What's wrong with you? I know. I don't know where they go. I don't know where they go. Charlie, you're okay right now. Okay? No one's hurting you. Everybody help fine. me. I know. Calm Can down. Help? <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. that. There's that. Which is the whole conversation was visual in nature. Yes. Which is great for podcasting. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I know what a podcast is. Sure. 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 Sure you do. Sure you do. Mm-hmm. Where can I watch your podcast? Well, and now they have video podcast. So that's because I said that the other day. I was like, oh my God, how stupid am I sometimes? I'm like, oh yeah, you know, uh, I want to watch it. And I'm like, oh, that was stupid. And my guest was like, well, I watch a lot of podcasts. And I'm like, oh, shut up. You what? know what I mean? Well, but what do you mean? Like on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. Because I was like, how do you, what, what is it? I don't get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Shut up. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Smarty pants. All right. We've got an interesting case today. You know what? I went into this kind of being like, eh. And then, really? well, I didn't know really anything about it. I mean, I've heard the my the dingo ate my baby thing, you know? But I didn't go into it being like, oh, I'm really excited to hear more about this case. And then once it started, I was like, oh my God, this is really interesting. Yeah. It's like... I, okay, I had never heard of it. Like, I did not, I've never picked up on any of those references, like pop culture references. So I was like, had no idea what was coming. And I was just like, wow, that sounds crazy. Yes. And then, yeah, it was crazy. But I was just like, I didn't know the quote. And everybody is like, yeah, you know, it's in in this movie or it's in that movie. I'm like, "I I never realized that. Yeah. I don't know how you've missed so much in life, to be honest, but I know that's not I don't what we're either. here to talk about. Yeah, that's true. That's for another day, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so you clicked on this. You already know what we're what we're talking about, the death of Azaria Chamberlain. And want to thank Madison for writing the script. And we also want to thank Daniela, Marie Louise Verbis, Holly, and Stacy Skilton for requesting it. Yes. Hey, girls. Thanks. Somebody sent me this somewhere. <laughs> this is already shaping up to be a great story. I know. And I, I'm i sorry. So what we normally do is we have a case submission form and you have to put it on there so that it makes it onto the master list. But somebody s- sent it. I don't remember where. It was like mentioned it on Facebook or something like that. And they were like, oh, you should check this case out. And it sounded so interesting because the the name of the case that I was given was Dingo Ate My Baby. So that immediately piqued my interest because it was like, oh my God. And I did not know the quote. So I looked into it and I was like, wow, that sounds crazy. So if you person are listening who sent that in and it you didn't go through the form, that's not normally how we do it. So I super apologize, but I did not write down. So I can't remember if I added your name to this list or not. So what I'm saying is if you're not mentioned, you're in my heart. I just don't. Yes. I didn't write it down because I'm. And that's oh. exactly why you got to go through the form because otherwise, if I look at it, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'll forget it. So, yeah. And if you want Torella to just play like Phil Collins and say, you'll be in my heart, it's like, that's, it's a sweet gesture, but it's like, people want the shout outs. Yeah, they do. They sure do. Yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Okay. Enough about how much Torella sucks. Yeah. But if you want to talk about something that doesn't suck, really quickly. We can talk about our Patreon. Yeah, I would love to. Have you hung out with us on there? You should. Yeah, it's a killer time. It really is. And again, not trying to toot our own horns, but we have a lot of people that tell us that nobody else puts out as much content as we do. Right. And I'm just saying. 
I mean, the people have spoken. And I feel like it's just a passive observation. It's not really like a judgment or anything. It's not like we're trying to like brag. It's a fact. Another passive observation is that we're both really pretty. <laughs> but I mean, again, just just observing things. Yeah. I mean, you can't yeah. help what you observe. Right. Yeah. So with the Patreon, if you are at a $10 or higher tier, you get two extra episodes a week. A week. And a week. All ad-free content. And you get, if it's a two-parter for a main feed case, you get both of them parts immediately. Mm-hmm. And you get you get ad-free and immediate access at any level, but the two bonus episodes a week, you got to be $10 or higher. But yes. that gives you three episodes a week, typically. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. That's like, I would say 10 to 12 episodes a month. Yes. At least. Yeah. That's a whole lot of killer queens. It sure is. Plus, we do a weekly live in our Patreon-only hangout group on Facebook. And mm-hmm. then we do a weekly live on the Instagram and free group. So you get us live if you're in the in the Patreon two times a week, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, holy hail. <laughs> right? Hails, bales. Yeah. So anyway, you know, there's reasons. We just like to tell you guys about that. Um, And if you join annually, you get 16% off. So if you pay like for the whole year, you get like two months free. That's pretty amazing. Can't beat that. Mm -mm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yeah. So, you know, check it out. Yeah. So what do you say we get started on the case? I don't know if I'm ready. No, Tarly, you better get ready because we're doing it. Let's do it. Okay. So a little brief overview. After the sun had set on August 16th, 1980 at Ayers Rock in Central Australia, 32-year-old Lindy Chamberlain ran from the tent at her campsite towards the communal barbecue area, screaming that a dingo had her baby. Nine-week-old Azaria Chamberlain, who'd been put to sleep just a few minutes earlier by her mother, Lindy, had disappeared from the tent. Lindy watched as a dingo ran out of their tent carrying something in its mouth. A search ensued, but the baby's remains were never found. Was a wild dingo to blame for the death of the baby girl or were her parents covering up her murder? That is just horrific. I guess we should do a trigger warning. Yeah. That this is a child death. Yes. Uh, It's so, oh my God. I just, I can't, I just cannot imagine that. No. Nine weeks old. I mean, my God, it's just, that is like literally living in a a nightmare, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a child at any age, but you know, just, yeah, it's just the whole, yeah. It's just so little. Oh, so little. I know. Okay. Let's talk about who Lindy and Azaria were. Alice Lynn Merchinson, known to friends and family as Lindy, was born on March 4th, 1948 in Wakatane in Northern New Zealand to Cliff and Avis Merchinson. Also, this is like Australia, New Zealand, we're probably going to mispronounce some stuff. Yeah, I think we already have mispronounced a lot exactly, of things. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> we probably already have. So, uh, you know, no hate. We are just Tennessee bumpkins, you know? Yep. Doing the best we can. When Lindy was almost two years old, her family moved to Victoria, Australia. Lindy's father was a pastor and they often moved churches yearly. She spent her childhood in Victoria and went to college in Benalla, Australia. Lindy worked odd jobs during vacation to earn money. She would waitress. She was a shop assistant, a clerk, receptionist, and bookkeeper. On November 18th, 1969, she married Michael Lee Chamberlain, a pastor at a nearby church. And not long after marrying, the newlyweds moved to Tasmania, where Michael pastored at several different churches. Four years after marrying, Lindy gave birth to the couple's first child, a son named Aiden Lee. In 1974, Lindy received a certificate in dressmaking, tailoring, and drafting from a technical college. The family of three then moved to Queensland, where Lindy gave birth to their second son, Reagan Michael. Lindy specialized in making wedding dresses while Michael continued his job as a pastor. The family continued to move around Australia and then settled in Mount Isa. On June 11, 1980, Azaria Chantel Lauren Chamberlain was born, the couple's first daughter. The family of five was happy. They had no idea that their lives would be catastrophically changed during their upcoming vacation. Oh, God. You know, and it's like, and it's also sad. I mean, we talk about this a lot with pretty much any case, but, you know, a lot of times the victim gets 
you know, lost. lost in the story. And that does happen here in a big way. But mm-hmm. also, there's not, she was just nine weeks old, you know? Mm-hmm. And I saw an interview with Lindy later on and they, you know, they said, what memories do you have of Azaria? And she's like, you know, there's some things I'm just going to keep to myself. And I think that's right. I think, I think that's beautiful. I think she does need something just for her, mm-hmm. you know? And in that, you know, in nine weeks, it's not like you can be like, well, she, you know, like it's those little moments together. Mm-hmm. I can't even talk about her. I'm going to cry. So anyway, okay. we just don't get a lot of, obviously she was just so young. There's there's not much we can say there. Mm-hmm. On Wednesday, August 13th, 1980, the Chamberlains left their home in Mount Isa to travel southwest to visit one of Australia's biggest natural attractions, Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock. Uluru is a massive sandstone rock monolith located in the Northern Territory's Aboriginal area of Australia. It's approximately 348 meters or more than 1,100 feet high and is known for its beautiful color changes from gold to red based on the changing sunlight. The site holds campgrounds and different caves and areas to hike and explore. The family arrived at Aluru late in the evening on the 16th. The Chamberlains parked and settled in an area near several other campers. Also in close proximity to their vehicle and tent was an Aboriginal camp, a general store, and a clinic. The family went to sleep, tired from their drive, and woke up the following morning ready to explore. Michael took the boys, Aiden, uh, who was six at the time, and Reagan, who was four, to climb up smaller portions of the rock. Lindy took nine-week-old Azaria with her to explore an area known as the Fertility Cave. After walking out of the cave, Lindy recalled that she saw a wild dingo watching her and the baby and that it made her very uncomfortable. So for those who are not familiar, dingoes are animals that are often compared to canines or wolves, though scientists have found that they are an entirely different species. Though they look similar to dogs, dingoes have a wider head and longer snout. They are predators and particularly prone to attacks on livestock. They are mainly found in Australia. And I have to say that would be very beneficial because I was talking to my roommate last night about this case and he was like, what's a dingo? And I was like, oh, it's kind of like a dog. I honestly said it was a, it was a dog, mm-hmm. um, like a wild dog. And he was like, oh, I thought it was like a kangaroo. And I was like, <laughs> no. Well, I mean, yeah. If you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm sure our Australian listeners are like, what a friggin' idiot. Yeah. But yeah, he he just had, like, Big Fat had no idea. Right. And the noise that dingoes make, Oof. it kind of reminds me, because we have a lot of coyotes in this area. Mm-hmm. And it is so scary when I go outside sometimes, because I'm like, is somebody holding some kind of, like, a sa- satanic sacrifice? Yeah. Or, like, what is happening? Because it's like, like everybody it just sounds like people are just screaming yeah and it's so like there's so many or it just Mm -hmm. is so loud yeah and they're yeah yeah, they're described in that area as apex predators so Mm -hmm. you know the nobody else is hunting them unless yeah the only people that would be hunting them are people who are hunting them yeah so i mean i feel like that's important to keep in mind too just given you know Lindy's story and just how the investigation goes, but these are predators. Mm-hmm. You know, they attack livestock. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that would be kind of the same thing if you went out, you know, a cougar or a yeah, yeah, something around here like a black bear or something. Or wolves. I mean, I mean, my God, yeah, yeah. They're like you know, again, they're they're not exactly the same, but they're like wolves. I mean, they're totally wild. They're not yeah. like. Because I think sometimes if people hear like, oh, yeah, you know, well, it's like a dog in Australia. They're like, oh, well, it's a dog. You can like you can pet it. No. I'm going to be honest with you. When I saw the pictures of them, I was like, well, they're pretty cute. Well, their blue healers are are kind of, they're kind of linked to dingoes. And, well, and like, are in a way. too? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're akin, I guess, in some way, but they're definitely not domesticated. They remind me a little bit of hyenas, too, just yeah. like how... They eat everything. I don't know. Hyenas scare the shit out of me. Yeah, same. I know. They will well, eat your bones. The Lion King will do that to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So as the day came to an end and the sun set, the Chamberlains joined several other campers at the communal barbecue area not far from their tent and vehicle. They spoke to another couple who had an infant with them, Greg and Sally Lowe. Sally said that when she walked to the trash can to throw away dinner trash, she saw a dingo following the steps behind her. Not long after, Michael and Aiden threw a piece of bread crust to a dingo that was near their barbecue. 
Finally, Lindy announced that it was time for her to put Bubby, which is what she called Azaria, to bed. She took the baby back to their tent, placed her in the bassinet, and left her in the tent with her brother, Reagan, who was asleep. Oh my God. I don't think I ever realized Reagan was in the tent, too. Can you even imagine? Can you even imagine? I know. Lindy returned to the barbecue area approximately 10 minutes after stepping away. Not long after, a loud infant cry was heard, then stopped suddenly. Lindy ran to see to the tent to find Azaria gone and a dingo that appeared to be carrying something leaving the tent. She cried out, the dingo's got my baby. Murray Haby, a man whose campsite was next to the Chamberlain's, grabbed a flashlight and ran off in the direction that Lindy indicated the dingo had run off to. Haby had been an amateur animal tracker for several years and was able to pick up a set of dingo tracks that appeared different from the others. The tracks were heavier, which indicated that either the dingo was bigger or it was carrying something. Haby followed the tracks for approximately 100 meters, then said it appeared the dingo had put down its load. There was a depression in the sand, which Haby said appeared to be an impression of a knitted gown with a wet spot beside it. And he really couldn't tell if it was blood or saliva. He had no idea. But he continued to follow the tracks before losing them by a car path. Police quickly arrived on the scene, and the first investigator noted spots of blood in the tent and paw prints leading away from the tent. As Lindy and Michael spoke with police, almost 300 people formed a human chain in an attempt to find any sign of Azaria. Unfortunately, the baby was gone. God, it's just heartbreaking. It really is. It's just heartbreaking. And knowing that the, you know that there was another child in the tent too, like— mm-hmm. You know, had the, I don't know how dingoes specifically work, but had there been more than one, both of those children could have been gone. I mean, oh, absolutely. Just... And they're big dogs and children are small. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, I guess Azaria was more of a, because she was more vulnerable I and mean, she's nine weeks old. Yeah. Yeah. She can't defend herself. Mm-mm. She couldn't get up to run if she, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's in the wild. Animals go after the young because mm-hmm. they're easier to catch. Mm-hmm. And they're lighter to carry and things like that. So again, and we're not trying to be morbid or disrespectful in any way, shape, or form, but it's it's relevant to the case because what ends up happening is just insane. And the fact is that all of this is believable, mm-hmm. and all of it points to that there was a dingo at that campsite. Well, I mean, the first officer on the scene said he noticed. <laughs> leading away tracks leading away yes and the other guy who is an amateur tracker like it's not like he he, you know yeah they freaking got daryl dixon from the walking dead basically right there next to him <laughs> he's a tracker like you know they have somebody who knows what they're talking about it's not like you know me looking down and being like yeah i mean i'm pretty sure that's a dingo track right exactly no like yeah yeah but it's let's crazy. get into the investigation because this just go ahead and get your window I ju- yeah. prepped, mm-hmm. get your shit to throw. It's it's a doozy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if this is your first episode with us, just when things just get absolutely insanity and you have anger and rage at a case, we found a safe way to let that out. So yes. you're going to open that window. Mm-hmm. You're going to throw all of your shit out of it, all of it. Yes, or defenestrate if you want to get technical. Yes, there is a word for it. We did learn. You can start with stuff you don't really care that much about. Eventually, though, with this case, it's all going to be gone. And that could include, like, I've got two dogs in the room with me. They're going to be out the window. Oh, and that's not right my fault. No. they wrong place, wrong time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's just, you know, there's some things you just cannot wave. Mm-hmm. I can't help that. Yeah, you can't help that, you know, because it's like, mm-hmm. it's that bad. So there you go. So Torella, take us on. <laughs> all right. Take us on the journey. As the days went on, hope dwindled that Azaria would be found alive. Police immediately were suspicious, though, of Lindy and Michael. They didn't believe a dingo could have taken Azaria from the tent and proceeded with their investigation with this belief in mind. Why, though? Exactly. Why, though? Like, yeah. Again, it's like, well, we saw the paw prints leading out of the tent and 90,000 people were like, yeah, there were dingoes around here. We fed them. Like, Well, and let's ask any of the aboriginal people that live there. Uh-huh. Is this something that could happen? I guarantee they would right. say, oh, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just crazy. So it wasn't long, though, before the public became suspicious of the Chamberlain story as well. If I could throw the media out the window, I would. (laughs) But unfortunately, it's frowned upon. Mm. 
The media said that it was an exotic location, a beautiful woman in suspicious circumstances. See, why does it always have to come back to the woman's looks? I why, know. why, 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 why? That doesn't make any sense. However, can I say one thing? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, <laughs> you know. You asked. You, you I asked. Know. I asked, and now I know. So that's great. an answer. Lindy's haircut at the time seems like it wouldn't work, but it really worked for her. And then as it grew out, it grew out really pretty. <laughs> that is incredibly true. Um, as somebody who does hair, I'm looking at it technically and I'm like, I could never. <laughs> like, it is so precise. Her bangs. Mm-hmm. It's impressive. I mean, I know. Like, whoever did that, like, knew what they were doing. They knew exactly the look for her. I mean, it was, it just looked great on her. And the thing is, I mean, yes, 100%, she was a very attractive woman. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. I mean, now we're getting into Darlie Routier. We're getting into yep. Who Killed Little Gregory. Like that, all that kind mm-hmm. of territory. They're going to tear yeah. her down because she has the audacity to, you know, like be put together. Mm-hmm. She's a nine week old and she cares about her looks. So obviously, she doesn't care about her child. I mean, that's clearly. Um, it's just a fact. Mm-hmm. Ugh. God, yeah. it makes me so mad. I know. The Chamberlains did several interviews, the first being a day after Azaria disappeared. Michael said that he saw spots of blood on the tent and the sharp, jagged marks on the thick, knitted blanket and felt it must have been a quick event. The public didn't feel right about the Chamberlains' lack of emotion during interviews, though. <sighs> so we watched, it's called the Lindy Tapes. It's on YouTube. The host of it, fine. Oh my God, is he fine? Denim Hitchcock, fine. Oh my God. I like, I texted Tori and I was like, I've never been so in love. Like, I'm just like, I love he this is, man. I know. And his dad is precious too. Oh my like, God, they're precious. I, I love know. them. You guys have to watch it though. It was really, really well done. It was really well done. But in this, I think the dad talks about it. Somebody, it was either the dad or one of the lawyers because the dad is a journalist. Yes. Or was, I don't know if he still is. But he covered this case and he was one of the people that was like, no, Mm -hmm. they didn't do it. It, it, He believed them. Yeah. But someone said that should not be a thing that people look at. Like you should not judge someone on their guilt or innocence based on how they're grieving a right. the loss of a loved one. But yet we do it every time. We talk about it every time. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, it, well, and and think about it from this perspective, because I was trying to think about, you know, all the, and did I used to think that? I did. Oh, 100%. And because that's the narrative that we're pushed, right? By the media and and by police who have tunnel vision and all those kind of things. Well, she didn't act right. So I, I knew it had to have been her. And now let's go find everything we can mm-hmm. to prove that. That's That's this case in a nutshell. But like, if you think about it from the Chamberlain's perspective, a wild animal fucking carried your nine week old baby off. And you don't know what has happened to this child. You're hoping against hope, wishing against wish that they're going to bring her back. But you know in your heart that that's probably not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And now you've got the police here and everything, but you've got the media in your face. So when you are really like, I was just thinking about like a time that I've been really upset or, you know, after somebody has passed away or whatever, if you have to be on and be entertaining and be, you know, answering questions. You don't have any time to just yourself, to grieve, to whatever. Like, first of all, that would piss me off. Mm -hmm. Like, I would get very frustrated and be like, I don't want to talk to you right now, you know? Like, I don't want to... But you also have to compartmentalize. You're not going to find your child rolled up in a ball rolling around on the floor, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get your shit together and get up and go look for her and do all the tactical things you got to do to make that happen. You've got to get the word out. You've got to talk to people. You've got to all these different things. And then when it's over, you can sit and cry. Like, Mm -hmm. but there's so many other factors that go into that. And everybody looks at them and says, well, they're not that upset. So they must not care. Yeah, exactly. And the media, the police, everybody, nobody gave them any time to ever feel it. So. Right. Never. Yeah. It's horrific. Mm-hmm. But anyway, 1980, I mean, still today, this happens all the time. Mm-hmm. But their lack of a re- emotion just raised suspicion of them. People thought that they were lying about what happened to the baby. 
They couldn't understand how two people could just be that composed after what they said had happened. (sighs) Okay. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, the public is pushing for the Chamberlains to be further investigated. The police are making mistakes as they continue to search for clues. During an interview with the police's forensic officer who processed the scene, I just had to take, I just had to take a second. (laughs) The officer said that, you guys, if you're driving, pull over, Mm -hmm. throw whatever you, you got a Starbucks that goes out the window, guys. I'm sorry. It just has to. That $7 drink is just gone. Gone. And there's nothing we can do about it. This forensic quote, officer, person who processed the scene said that she had to rely on newspapers to write a report because she didn't really know what she was doing. She had been working in forensics for three months at this point. Three months. And was put on, you know, the biggest case of her entire life. Yeah. And you know what? I get like, You've been on a job three months. It's not like you can just never do the job. Fine. Bring her on with somebody who's more experienced. How in the world is it ever appropriate for a person who's processing a scene to read newspaper articles to figure out what am I even looking for? So by the newspaper article, she's finding out, well, people either think that the dingo did it or that the parents did it. So I guess, well, that's what I need to figure out here. And 90% of those. I would say 95% mm-hmm. yep. are incredibly biased against the Chamberlains. They exactly. are saying they did it. This is not real because when we watched the Lindy tapes, they found two people <laughs> that were like, nope, they didn't do it. Uh-huh. Now, I'm sure there were more, but yeah, it's a small pool of people that were like, yeah, definitely. And even now, after all of this, I mean, it's not a spoiler alert, guys. They, the parents did not do this. Even now, knowing everything that we know, I forget Denim's dad's name. Oh, I Mr. forgot. Mr. Hitchcock. His. Yeah, Mr. Hitchcock said that it's still it's still probably about 50-50 in that area of people think that she did it or didn't do it. I cannot even imagine. And that's with, I mean, very stark evidence that she didn't fucking do it. So well, yeah, and absolutely zero evidence that she did, but mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's just I just don't understand how that's not cause for a a mistrial or, you know, like you can't be using the media as a forensic investigator. Like you're supposed to be relying on what you see. Yeah, your job and like your training to be like, okay, well, here, I've got this onesie in front of me and it was at one time on the child. Does it look to me that a dingo took it off or not? Does it match, you know, like... Mm -hmm teeth marks or something like that. Not, well, let me read the newspapers. And a lot of people are suspicious of the parents. And you know what? The parents didn't really act all that upset and blah, 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 blah. Oh, and Lindy got her hair cut and she wears um, clothes that are form-fitting to her body. She wears makeup, the audacity of this bitch. So yeah, I'm going to now probably go with that it was scissors that cut it off. Right. But let's keep going. Let's keep going. Witnesses who seemed to corroborate the Chamberlain story did not feel like their accounts were being taken seriously. So remember Murray, Haby, and we're probably saying his last name wrong. No, it's it's Haby. I, I mean, from the Lindy Prod uh, tapes, it was Haby. Oh, good. Okay. So this is the guy who had originally like tracked the dingo because he was an amateur tracker. He called the police and he was like, hey, you know, I saw a dingo at the campsite minutes before this attack occurred. And he even got pictures of it. He took two pictures of the dingo that came, he said, within six feet of him. Mm -hmm. And he was inside his van, he said, and he took two pictures of it. And he, you can still see the pic, I mean, he still has the pictures. And he's like, this is 20, 30 minutes tops before Azaria went missing. And he said that the police plainly told him well, we're only looking for information that's going to help convict Lindy. So thank you, but no thanks. I cannot even. And oh my God. The photos were never shown at the trial. I don't even think that Murray Haby testified. I can't remember if he did or not. Maybe for the defense, but I don't think, I mean, he definitely didn't. They didn't, he wasn't able to help the prosecution at all because they were like, absolutely not. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you can only answer what they ask you. And it's like, it's, it's yeah, set it's up that way. Yeah. Calculated to get the narrative that they want. Yeah. 
The first four investigators assigned to the Chamberlain case had differing opinions about what they believed happened to Azaria. John Lincoln strongly believed that Lindy was lying. He said there's no possible way a dingo could carry a 10-pound baby several hundred yards. Are you serious? I don't even... (laughs) I have watched... I have a guess. This is not the same thing, but it's kind of the same thing. She's got a dog. She doesn't come to me anymore because of reasons. It's everything's fine. But she was a very interesting lady. Uh, She wanted a bright red mullet, which is why she doesn't come to me anymore because I couldn't style that mullet. I tried. (laughs) Couldn't do it. But she had a dog who his favorite toy was a bowling ball. (laughs) A 10-pound bowling ball. And that's what he would play with. And how big was this dog? It wasn't that... I mean, uh, gosh, I think it was a German Shepherd mix. Mm. A bowling ball. Pretty comparable. Yes. Yeah. A bowling ball. And he played with that like 10, 12-pound bowling ball. That was what he played with. Well... Carried it around everywhere. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about like any any nature really, but like I know that you have one client who has like, you know, a little dog and was it an owl or a hawk that almost took it? It was a hawk. Yeah. She had to get a spe- like a special... And this dog, she's six pounds soaking wet. Teeny little thing. But she had to get a special like t-shirt or whatever it's called. It's like a vest almost with spikes on it. Mm-hmm. So a yeah, hawk so would come Yeah, so if this dog it. is, let's say, let's call it five pounds, a hawk is going to be, I would say, a lot smaller than a fucking dingo. Uh, yeah. I mean, relatively, you know what I mean? Um, they're definitely built differently, but, you know, if a hawk or an owl can come take my dog out of my yard, Mm -hmm. if a, I'm learning a A lot of fox, Uh uh-huh. Yep. Foxes. Like we've, we've had to worry about foxes taking our dogs out of the yard, coyotes, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, and my dad said, cause I walked the dogs and he was like, you better be careful with your dogs with coyotes. Mm -hmm. And Tori's dogs are 60, 70 pounds. Yeah. They're big girls. Yeah. And I'm very sure that if Apple, the 75-pound dog, if she wasn't as lazy as she was, she could carry me around. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. But like, you know, do you remember seeing that video that came out, I think it was a couple years ago now, where there was a guy who was like on a walk somewhere, I forget where, I think in California. (gasps) Was it the the, cougar or mountain lion was stalking him? Yes, yes, yes. And had he not scared that thing off, that cat would have taken his ass down. Mm -hmm. There's just no comparison when you've got an animal whose instinct is to feed itself, its baby, you know, like hunger can change an animal real quick. mm -hmm. They make moves that they probably never would have made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just, it's just this like brute strength, you know, adrenaline Mm -hmm. and all the things like it just, like their thing was like, you know, the dingo couldn't have carried a 10 pound baby. Like, are you fucking kidding me with that? Well, first of all, are you a fucking scientist? No. No. Do you know these things? No. Are you David Attenborough? No. No, exactly. And also they were like, a dingo would not come that close to people. I'm like, well, it fucking did. Ask Murray Haby. Exactly. Like the other people said they they fed it a they little bit. They hand fed it, yeah, basically. They're, yeah, they're throwing, like that dingo was close. Mm-hmm. And you're telling me that that's not possible? Will it happen? You weren't there. Exactly. Like, just fuck off with that. So John Lincoln, the one who said he a dingo can't carry a 10-pound baby. Absolutely not. Had reportedly left the room and returned with a bucket filled with 10 pounds of sand, which he held in his mouth for less than a minute before challenging the other officers to do better. I'm okay. sorry, sir. Are you <laughs> saying that your jaws are the same? As a wild animal who kills prey with its mouth. And let's be fair here. The teeth aren't the same, obviously. Carrying a bucket when it's the all the weight is concentrated in one spot like that. Uh-huh. That's not the same. No. A baby, depending on where the 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 dingo picked it up, it could have picked it up by a little piece of fabric. Like my one of my dogs would have done, you know? It mm-hmm. could have picked it up by the the I don't know. I don't know, but yeah. that's not the that's not a correct comparison. That's stupid. No, yeah, that's not that's not even close. Like you've got an animal that sir, okay. Mm-hmm. John Lincoln, when is the last time that you were outside and you saw a chicken even. We'll even just go with a chicken. And you wrestled that bitch to the ground with just your bare teeth. Right. 
That's not how we eat. Right. Somebody brought it to you on a plate, fully cooked. You cut it with a knife and a fork and your baby little jaws gingerly chewed that until you swallowed it. Like that's not what we're talking about. And you're, and Hey, you know what? I'm not a scientist, but I just thought that we were not the same as like dingoes. (laughs) I could be wrong. You could be wrong. And I think you are, but well, obviously I'd have to talk to John Lincoln about that, but yeah, he's, he's the expert here. Clearly the police investigating tape recorded everything, including interviews and conversations that took place at the station. So I thought this was very interesting. They didn't just record like interviews and interrogations with like witnesses and suspects. They recorded conversations between each other as well. And honestly, I love that idea. I do too. I don't like, apparently that used to be protocol and it's not anymore. And I just like, don't get why. I mean, that's very much like the body cam stuff. It's like, Mm -hmm. because it, it, you would think it protects you, right? Either it protects you or holds you accountable. And either way, I'm here for it. Exactly. Yeah. During Lindy's first interview, the detectives hounded Lindy because she couldn't say for certain what she saw in the dingo's mouth. She said that the dingo had its head down below the level of light. Detective Sergeant Graham Charlwood, who had taken over the Chamberlain case, didn't believe Lindy's story either. He said that the events she described were just totally against the habits of dingoes. Again, we have people who who are detective sergeants for the police uh-huh. who clearly have had extensive dingo training. Sure. You don't know. Well, like I could say all day long, like, oh yeah, that would be weird for a bear to do something like that. That would be weird for a cougar. I, I don't fucking know. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And even if you take like a, a domesticated animal, yeah, a dog, your family pet normally doesn't, snap, attack, whatever. Mm -hmm. But does it happen sometimes? It does. I've watched it happen. Yeah. Yeah. They're still technically wild animals. I mean, they're domesticated, but they're still animals. And that instinct is going to take over sometimes. Absolutely. You try to take away a dog's food when it's eating, like, you know, people with little kids and animals, that's you always teach them, do not go over there when the dog is eating and don't take its food away. They get very protective. Mm -hmm. So again, Even if you do know every habit of every animal, which you do not, not everything happens that way. Yeah. Life uh, finds a way. (sighs) Exactly. Mm -hmm. One week after Azaria's disappearance, hiker Wally Goodwin set out for a hike in the base of Ayers Rock. Out on an animal path with thick foliage, Goodwin spotted some shredded clothing. They turned out to be Azaria's jumpsuit, diaper, and booties. Mm, I'm so sad. I know. The police continued attempting to build their case against Lindy, though. They conducted experiments to test Lindy's story, seemingly in attempts to disprove what she said. They tested samples of hair, vegetation, and blood found on Azaria's clothing. They examined the tears found in her clothing, trying to determine if they were caused by humans or animals. At a wildlife reserve, meat was wrapped in baby diapers and given to dingoes so they could study the result. With the coroner's report ready, the court proceeded with the first of four coroner's inquests into the death of Azaria. Hmm. I think that the what they're doing with the dingoes and the baby diapers is the is way closer to an actual investigation into what a dingo would do than somebody putting 10 pounds of sand in a bucket and being like, well, I can't hold it. Mm -hmm. I've got nipples. Jack, uh, Jack, could you milk me? (laughs) Could you milk me? Yeah. Well, and you're wrapping meat in a diaper, giving it to dingoes who are in a wildlife reserve that I'm going to assume, yeah, are fed (laughs) regularly. And then you've got this animal who everybody at the compound said seemed hungry. You could tell it was hungry. Yeah. Who knows when the last time this guy ate? Exactly. What do you think is going to stand in the way between that animal and food? Nothing. Uh, n- yeah, not shit. Exactly. Yeah. On February 20th, 1981, the court in Alice Springs, Australia, held the first inquest. In the courtroom, the coroner gave her findings that she believed that Azaria's death was caused by a dingo. However, she felt that there was a human intervention after her death. Based heavily on the fact that they didn't believe her clothing was fa- left there by dingoes, that it was likely intentionally placed. How would they? Okay. (laughs) They said the body of Azaria was taken from the possession of the dingo and disposed of by an unknown method by a person or person's name unknown. 
That is they, the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Yeah. The, Do you so, really think that you could wrestle <laughs> yeah. clothing away from a hungry dingo? Yeah. And so be like, the, I'm just going to put this over here. Uh huh. So the dingo took the baby. And then you were like, excuse me, dingo. Can you just give me the clothes back, please? And he's like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't even, what, what the fuck are you talking about? By a person or person's name unknown. By an unknown method. That's just, that's stupid. That's stupid. Mm-hmm. You'd be better than that. Yeah. And how would they even fucking, I just, I can't. I'm so, I'm frustrated. Yeah. They felt the clothing showed signs of being removed by a human rather than an animal. In September of 1981, police conducted a four and a half hour search of the Chamberlain's home where they seized over 300 items, including the family's yellow Tirana. Is it Tirana? I don't know. Tirana? That was driven during the camping trip. I've never heard of this kind of car, but I know, Mm -hmm. of course, other countries have different kinds of cars, but... Yeah. It seemed like these were pretty popular or at least abundant in that area. There seemed to be quite a bit of them, but I've never heard of it. A re-examination of Azaria's clothing indicated to Detective Charlwood that no dingo was involved in Azaria's death, that the animal hairs found were from a cat. Mm. This guy is an expert on so many different kinds of four-legged creatures. I'm... I know. It's crazy. He eagerly shared this information with Lindy. I'm sure he was like, gotcha, bitch. Mm -hmm. Oh, 100%. In November, the attorney general filed a motion to negate the results of the first coroner's inquest due to new evidence they'd found, the presence of a large amount of fetal blood in the Chamberlain's vehicle. (laughs) And the thing is, the first coroner's inquest should have been the end of it when they said a dingo did, in fact, take the baby. Mm -hmm. But because they left it open at the end with but we think somebody disposed of the body in the clothing mm-hmm. in the clothing then the police got their go ahead to continue investigating them right and <laughs> and if they find quote new evidence that shows that the Chamberlains did in fact kill Azaria well game's over like we can, now we can charge them we can arrest them we can do whatever we want mm-hmm. but it, it was like you were doing so good and then you were like But they took the... (laughs) From the thing. Okay, okay. You were so close. Yep. Let's talk about the second inquest. On December 14th, 1981, the second coroner's inquest began. The barrister who was assisting the coroner in this inquest made it very clear from the beginning that he believed Lindy had taken Azaria from the campsite that night and murdered her in the passenger seat of the family vehicle with something sharp. Mm Mm-hmm. Biologist Joy Cole said that she found fetal blood in 22 separate places, including underneath the passenger side dashboard as well as the door in the seat. Unfortunately, all the samples that Cole had used in her testing had been destroyed during testing, a practice that she said was common. So we can't retest them. She's like, just take my word for it. Mm -hmm. I do that all the time. Another expert, Professor James Cameron, which... Oh, wow. He's, love his movies. Yeah, he's well-rounded, isn't he? Yeah. Testified that the Terra Nazaria's jumpsuit was more consistent with being cut with scissors or a sharp object rather than an animal's teeth. Cameron also said that the signs were consistent with the baby. Oh, God. And I'm sorry, guys, but trigger warning here. With the baby being decapitated, I guess we can go ahead and say this now, but Professor Cameron, who was just taken at his word during all this, during like this investigation, they later found out that many wrongful convictions came back to his evidence, his analysis. This is like a Dwayne Deavers in the staircase. This is like a a Michael West in the Innocence Files. Like Mm -hmm. this is somebody who didn't know what the fuck he was talking about and was given the right and responsibility to determine the outcome of people's entire lives. <laughs> Just no big deal. Yeah. Let's not make one phone call, you know, and like verify right. that somebody actually has expertise in what they're saying. Well, yeah. And the fact that some of these people, the, uh, I don't know, attorneys or medical examiners or whoever, it, that the idea or the driving force behind them is like, let's just convict them no matter what cost. Mm-hmm. That's scary and that's really sad. Well, it is. And something that I don't know burns my bucket too is when it is so hard, I feel like in cases that we've seen, it's so hard for a defense team to get an expert witness 
qualified in the court, it seems like. Well, yeah, because the judge denies it or they don't have the money or... Right. So it seems like there's a lot of extra hoops for a defense expert to jump through. And a lot of times we just see that the judge is just like, well, no, I don't know. I don't think they're qualified enough. So they're just not going to be able to testify or whatever. Or Mm -hmm. like you said, they don't have the money. But it seems like when the prosecution brings an expert witness on, how many times have we seen a prosecution's expert witness actually did not know what the fuck they were talking about and they don't have the credentials? Yeah, there's no vetting. Yeah, there's no vetting process. So it's just like they come in and they just tell the court, this is my expertise. Okay. Well, then how come we're not, nobody's following up there? Like, Mm -hmm. I'm fine with, with the defense expert witnesses being vetted. Let's do that for all of them. Yeah, I mean, the it's stacked against the defense from day one, no matter what. There's mm-hmm. nothing you can do. Yeah, 100%. There was also the argument that there was no saliva present on Azaria's jumper. And Lindy was like, you know, because they're saying, well, if this dingo is carrying the baby in his mouth, her mouth, whatever, then there should have been animal saliva. We don't see that here. And she's like, well, that's because... Azaria was wearing a jacket. Oh, they called it a matinee jacket, but it, you know, it's just like a little, it, it honestly looked like somebody like knitted crocheted it. or knitted mm-hmm. it themselves. Yeah. It's like little, three little buttons mm-hmm. kind of open at the bottom in the front. Yeah. And over yeah. her, what we would call a onesie and they call a jumper. Mm-hmm. So she's like, that's why, because the jacket was over everything. So the animal was probably in direct contact with the jacket, not the actual jumper. Mm-hmm. And that's why. And because they didn't locate this jacket, it became a joke with police that it never actually existed. That's wrong. Like, how's that funny? It's not. Yeah. But also, there's pictures of Azaria in this jacket. Mm -hmm. In her, And that's why I'm like, yeah, it feels like somebody knitted it themselves. It was probably something that came from, like, her grandma or something, you know? Right. And there's pictures of her in it. And now it's gone. And you know the other people at the campsite could be like, yeah, she was wearing the jacket that night. Yeah, but they didn't bother to talk to anybody mm -mm. that was there. And they're just like, well, that jacket did not exist. You're making the existence of it up. Like, Mm -hmm. because you can't find it, that doesn't mean it didn't exist. That means you can't find it. Right. See how those two things are different? Yep. But we see that a lot, too, where it's like, well, we theorize that this person took this uh, knife from the butcher block because see that butcher block is missing that knife, right? So that means that's the knife they used and then they hid it somewhere. But the knife's not there. Well, yeah, that's because he threw it away. But that's not evidence. And people will get convicted on shit like that. Yeah. Just because it could have happened doesn't mean it did happen. Even if it's likely to have happened doesn't mean well, it did and happen. That's the, thing. the prosecution doesn't have to prove it. No. They don't have to come up with the smoking gun. Nope. The defense does. Mm-hmm. But yeah. the prosecution, they don't have to do jack shit. It's what it feels like. It's just fucking insane. So at the end of the second coroner's inquest, Lindy Chamberlain was charged with the murder of Azaria, and Michael was charged with assisting his wife in escaping mm-hmm. punishment. Wow. So we're going to get into the trial. On September 13th, 1982, the trial against the Chamberlains began. At this point, Lindy was seven months pregnant with a baby girl. This did not help her case. Ugh. I mean, now we're back to who killed Gregory. Yep. The public and likely the jury viewed her pregnancy with suspicion, concerned that she appeared to have gotten over her daughter's death. (laughs) Her demeanor hindered her. However, those close to the Chamberlain said Lindy felt like she couldn't do anything right if she smiled and looked friendly people would think that she didn't care about Azaria's death, but if she looked stoic, then she looked guilty. Mm -hmm. Regardless, the public felt that the couple accepted their loss too quickly. That's not for the public to decide. No. And yeah, how is that like, if they had lost a child any other way or even this way, which was absolutely tragic, but like, it's nobody's to decide when you're ready to have another kid. I just, no. Yeah. During the trial, they told Lindy they, that they believed she'd cut her daughter's throat while she laid in the passenger seat. Lindy began sobbing, saying, we're talking about my baby daughter, not some object. That is so sad. No, exactly. And they're, they're just crucifying her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, the, and again, this is, yeah, you're treating a victim's mother, mm-hmm. a victim herself, like garbage. And you're talking about her 
daughter's death, which you know was brutal, Mm -hmm. as like, they're almost like making it more cinematic, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, let's just make it. Yes. And let's make it as salacious as possible and whatever. Because to them, it's not, it's not a real thing, right? It's just Mm -hmm. like, Whatever it's thing that her, that happened, but it doesn't. It never hits close to home. Yeah, this is her child. I just mm-hmm. it's awful. The defense brought pathologist Barry Botcher to the stand as one of their key witnesses. He said that something in the car was curdling their evidence or their agents, referencing the chemical agents they'd used to test for fetal blood. He said that those weren't the results you'd see if Azaria's blood was truly in the vehicle. Unfortunately, Botcher's testimony proved too technical for the jury. He later said that he felt like he truly let the Chamberlains down. While there were many people who believed Lindy was guilty of murder, there were still people who argued her innocence. There were many Aboriginal trackers who lived near where Azaria disappeared that were never interviewed by police. They could track where that specific dingo went and where it dragged Azaria. They all said that Lindy was not guilty. The prosecution called London odontologist, who is a teeth guy, for an expert opinion on the mouth of a dingo. He (laughs) testified that a baby's head would not fit in a dingo's jaw. However, the defense rebutted this claim by showing a a photo taken of a dingo with the head of a human-sized baby doll fitting snugly in its jaw. The odontologist said that maybe he had been mistaken. Mm, We're not going to go into this right now, but don't even get us started on forensic odontology. Those are not the kinds of mistakes that you're able to make. If that's your job, you can't make that kind of mistake. Nope. You got to do better because because if you about, don't know, then say I don't know. Yeah, we're talking about essentially life and death. Yeah, because I don't think that if I'm not mistaken, I feel like Australia they don't do a death sentence there. I don't think so. But we're talking about possibly life in prison mm-hmm. or not. Yeah, for the you know, it's wrongful conviction. But yeah, whatever. it was also brought up that when dingoes attack their prey, they tend to grab it by the head and then shake it in their mouth in order to break its neck. This would produce a minimal amount of blood. The prosecution presented the following theory. Lindy left the communal barbecue area with Aiden and Azaria and walked her son to the tent. He went in and she left him and walked with her daughter to the passenger seat of their vehicle where she cut Azaria's throat and stuffed her in a camera bag. Then she came back to the tent, cleaned herself off, and planted the blood in the tent. After that, she went back to the communal barbecue. The issue with the the defense took with all of this was that this all had to happen. Every little bit that we just talked about had to happen in 10 minutes or less, 10 minutes. Witnesses said that they saw Lindy after she put Azaria to bed, head to toe, and that they didn't see any blood on her. Three witnesses specifically said that they heard the babies cry loud after Lindy appeared or returned to the barbecue area. Sally Lowe, the Chamberlain's camping neighbor, testified at the trial saying that she was positive that she'd heard a baby's loud, serious cry that was cut off suddenly coming from the area of the Chamberlain's tent after Lindy had returned to the barbecue area. Multiple witnesses said that they had seen dingoes during the time period, even having to shoo them away from the children. (sighs) So an important question that still remained, why would Lindy kill her kid? Why? Yeah. Many theories were created to explain why she'd possibly cut the throat of her infant daughter, most revolving around religion. Some said that Azaria was intended as a sacrifice for the sins of the church that Michael pastored for. (laughs) I want to give people time to let that sink in. Uh That's what somebody said, but okay. Okay. A witness said that after the incident, Michael had come to the door of her camper and said, a dingo has taken our baby and she's probably dead by now. When the witness attempted to comfort Michael, he said, whatever happens, it's God's will. She said then that at some point, Michael and Lindy walked off alone into the bushy area for 15 to 20 minutes, which the prosecution theorized was the time they took that they took the camera bag with Azaria's body and buried it in the brush. Michael's testimony didn't do much to help him. They suggested that his lack of immediate questioning of Lindy and the fact that he didn't run to look for Azaria was due to the fact that he already knew his daughter was dead at the hands of his wife. Michael obviously denied this, but those watching his testimony felt that he was very nonchalant and not acting like a grieving father. Yeah. And, you know, by the time he's questioned or giving his testimony, this is, you know, how many times has he talked to the police? How many times has he given right. interviews? Like, And they're also very, they're spiritual people. So, you know, for them to say something like it's in God's hands or, you know, she's in a better place and people are like, well, they just don't care. Like, Mm -hmm. you know. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. 
A total of eight forensic experts were called and testified on behalf of the Chamberlain's defense to dispute the questionable test results regarding everything from blood to fibers. Many witnesses were also called to testify about their personal relationships and opinions of the Chamberlain family. They called them a loving and happy family, nothing out of the ordinary. Sally Lowe said that Lindy even had a new mom glow to her. During the prosecution's closing arguments, they admitted that they hadn't proved a motive. However, they said that that wasn't their job. Their job was to prove that Lindy Chamberlain had murdered her daughter. They turned the case around, telling the jurors to consider the case against the dingo that had been laid out, claiming that it wasn't sufficient evidence to convict the dingo, <laughs> that the case would have been laughed out of court. Oh, the dingo's not on trial. No. And also, all that's doing is just making a mockery of this whole thing. Yes. Like, why are we making jokes? Right. And... That's saying if you're taking any alternate suspect or whatever, it, you can't as the prosecution be like, well, look at the evidence, quote, laid out against the boyfriend or whatever. If it's, you know, something like that, you can't do that because there's not evidence laid out against the boyfriend. The boyfriend's not on trial. You can only look at the evidence laid out against the defendant in this trial. Well, and my God, I mean, the defense sure is shit is not allowed to do anything like that. Exactly. They're not allowed. They get denied bringing yeah. up things that are pertinent to the case a lot of times. Exactly. So yeah, if there was, you know, like the defense couldn't bring on, I'm sure a bunch of stuff that would have been mm -hmm. relevant to the dingo having done this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They say, well, you can't bring that on. Because why? Because the dingo's not on trial. Well, exactly. <laughs> and I'm sure the prosecution would have said some shit like, well, did, did you question the dingo? Exactly. Did, did you ask him to come in for testimony? Like, fuck off, man. This is ridiculous. I just cannot with this shit. Prior to the jury retiring for deliberation, the justice presiding over the trial reminded them of this. How could Sally Lowe have heard the baby cry after Lindy's return if Azaria was already dead and inside of the Chamberlain car? Many people in the courtroom fully expected an acquittal, particularly after this remark. Yvonne Kane, a juror on the case, said that everyone seemed to go into the case suspicious of Lindy's guilt. The first round of jurors' votes read three for guilty, three for not guilty, and three undecided. They debated for six hours and 15 minutes before coming out with a verdict. Lindy was found guilty for the murder of her daughter. She was sentenced to life in prison with hard labor. And remember, she's seven months pregnant at this point. Mm -hmm. In the courtroom, as the verdict was read, Lindy reacted as though she'd been shot. It was unheard of for, to find someone guilty of the murder with no body, no murder weapon, no witnesses, and no motive. Michael was found guilty of accessory after the fact and given a suspended sentence of 18 months. I just, I mean, at least he was still able to raise their children because my God. I know. Just a month after starting her sentence at Barima Prison, Lindy gave birth to a healthy baby girl named Kalia. Is that right? I'm going to say so. While many were satisfied that Lindy was in jail, there were still people who felt confident that Lindy was innocent and were hell-bent on proving it. Botcher, who testified during the trial that there was something causing the false reading of the blood in Chamberlain's car, still felt something was skewing the results. And he was like hellbent on. He mm -hmm. was like, there is something wrong with this reading. What is it? Well, and I think for his lower third on the Lindy tapes, it said amateur investigator. Like, I don't even think this is what he does for a living, but he was like, eh, eh. Oh, you're talking about the guy um, with the... I know who you're talking about. You're talking oh, about the, the car guy thing. with the car. The car thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The car thing. I'm sorry. We're yeah. about to get to him. I'm so sorry. I, yeah. got, I got ahead of myself here. Yeah, this but guy I just was a... love something. Yeah, I, a scientist of some sort. I do love the fact, though, that so many people were like, absolutely not. We're not We're not dealing with this. Like, this yes. is not okay. Yeah, because if, if all this hadn't have happened, I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. So the Chamberlains had lived in a mining town, and he was like you know, maybe something in the air is causing this like false reading. So he went to their hometown mm -hmm. and he quickly noticed that there was this like dust everywhere. He said it was like on, you know, door handles. It covered the car. It was like just everywhere. You could see this dust. So he starts taking samples from several different places of the town and the dust tested positive for copper oxide dust, which had caused it to test positive for fetal blood. And he said it tested positive just as rapidly as blood did. It wasn't like it took like three, you know, hours longer than it would take blood or whatever. Like it tested positive immediately. And I, you know what? I bet all the testing that he did wasn't immediately 
disintegrated and destroyed. After yeah, he's it. like, oh, I can't show you any of that. No, that's definitely gone. I have self-destruct on all of my <laughs> experiments exactly. too. You understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we've got that. And then we have the amateur investigator that you the were talking, talking about. about. Yep, sorry, yeah. got it wrong. So this is amazing. He was helping a friend photocopy the court transcripts for the Chamberlain family. They just like needed, you know, help from other people because they're running out of money at this point. So as he's copying these things, he's reading through it, you know, because he's got to feed the paper in or whatever. So he's like reading through it. And he said that he read about the blood spatter that was found on the metal bracket under the dash of the passenger seat. And he's like, that's weird. So he goes out and finds literally as many of the same car that he can find, like junkyards, scrapyards. Yeah, he, he said he was um, getting papers every day to search to see if somebody was selling a car like this. Uh-huh. And he found as many as he could. And, you know, he finds the same make and model. And he noticed they all had the exact same spot. So if you look at the picture of the bracket, there's spots on it that could look like blood drops. And so he looks at every other one of these vehicles that he picks up and he looks at that bracket and the spots are in the exact same spot every single time Mm -hmm. as the one of the Chamberlain family car. Now, what are the odds, (laughs) okay, that they all have blood spatter on the same spot? Right. The prosecution's like, clearly Lindy has done this before. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah clearly yeah I mean and you know you know that's some shit that they would do be like Mm -hmm. well I guess we need to um, investigate these people because they've obviously killed somebody in their car too like yeah absolutely I just so what ended up happening what he found out was that the the spots weren't blood spatter they were paint over spray from when the car was built Mm-mm. And so then you've got you've got overspray, which the forensic people were like, that looks like blood. Let's test it. Okay, I'll give him that. Fine. That looks like blood. Let's test it. It tests positive for fetal blood because this dust is all over the car. And now none of it, it none of it's blood. Mm-hmm. None of it was it's ever all paint blood. and dust. Yeah. yeah. Another person concerned about Lindy's conviction was an animal hair expert. He'd contacted police during the trial to volunteer his help with the examination, but they wouldn't let him, of course. With the trial being over, he was allowed access to a small bag labeled cat hairs. And he said the hairs were clearly dog hairs and that he could have told them that straight from the beginning. But But of course, they they didn't want to hear it. So he's like, this is so not a cat hair. This is a dingo hair. I don't really know how you know that. But anyway, that's what he says. Yes. I'm not huge on hair analysis at all anymore. Right. In February of 1986, uh, an English hiker was climbing Ayers Rock when he fell to his death. As search and rescue attempted to recover his body, one of the team members saw a piece of clothing partially buried in the sand. He said he knew immediately what it was. They brought Lindy in to identify the piece of clothing, and she confirmed that it was Azaria's matinee jacket found in an area full of dingo layers. It wasn't long before the chief minister ordered for Lindy's release from prison. On February 7th, 1986, Lindy was released from prison. The fourth inquest was open after her release where the information was brought forward regarding three fatal dingo attacks on children that had occurred since the third inquest and Lindy's conviction. (laughs) During the inquest, it was said that the evidence is sufficiently adequate, clear, cognate, or, oh. Cogent? Cogent? I don't know what that word means. I don't either. Good time to look it up. And exact. And to exclude all other reasonable possibilities that than that a dingo entered the tent where Lindy and Michael Chamberlain's young child lay resting on that August night 32 years earlier. 32 years. (laughs) The official cause of death of on Anzaria Chamberlain's death certificate was changed from unknown to dingo attack. Though their prison time was over, the Chamberlains still had to clear their names. They eventually received $1.3 million in compensation. Michael and Lindy ultimately divorced. Lindy remarried and Michael died in 2017 after battling leukemia. Aiden, the uh, Chamberlain's oldest child, is now married and he and his wife use the same vehicle that the family traveled to Ayers Rock in to make their wedding arrival. Aiden blamed himself for quite some time, upset that he didn't zip the tent up that night. Mm. Reagan, the child who was asleep in the tent with Azaria, when she disappeared, still has memories of that night. 
He said that he and his brother suffered endless ridicule from classmates about the case and their missing sister. Kalia, the youngest daughter, was born to Lindy in prison, ignores that when people say that she was a replacement child after Azari's death. What is wrong with people? I have no idea. What is wrong with people? Oh my God. Lindy always wanted four children and that Kalia had brought happiness to the family after Azaria's tragic death. There are still many people who believe that Lindy had a hand in her daughter's death. The Chamberlain's attorney said that suspicion will never fully be cleared from her, that he could show them a tape of a dingo taking a baby and they still wouldn't believe her. Mm, That is just, it's tragic. It's tragic all the way around. And people to make fun of those kids at school, they're like, oh, your mom killed your sister. Ha, ha, ha. Like, yeah. What in the world? I cannot. I know. The whole thing. It's so sad. These people have been through hell. Yes, absolutely. All of them. And not even just due to the vicious attack on their daughter or sister, but also the endless ridicule and scrutiny that they've had to go undergo from the yep. media and from people just being hateful and heinous. Yeah, absolutely. It's horrific. Well, after all that, it would be interesting to see if anybody actually thinks that Lindy did it. Yeah. I mean, let us know. And people who are from the area, let us know what you think about the case in general. Like, what is your experience with it? Yeah. I know it's it's a big case. Yeah. Have you ever been around dingoes too? Like, you know. Yeah. You know, because there's people here who have, you know, had coyotes or mountain lion, you know, like whatever. So yeah, just interesting. Bear, bear attacks, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah, definitely. Let us know. And you know, we love you guys and yes, we'll catch you on the next episode. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay. You guys, we have some shout outs to do. Hey, hey, hey. We just want to say, Hey girl, thanks to some of our newest patrons and Hey girl, thanks to Kimberly Hudson, Carolina Janelle, Adeline Rose Jacobson, Samantha Carmack, Stacy LaRocca Eckerson, Sierra Fontaine, Kelsey Evans, Samantha Eubanks, Erica Heldenbrand, Kyle Hill, Marissa Rice, Jamie Crispin, Marissa Gloria, Kel McDonald, Rarney, Emily Nelson, Emma Tello, Morgan Billmeyer, Blair Christensen, Logan Gwaltney, Sandy, Megan Kindhammer, Beauty Killer, Daphne Puerto, Maddie, Rosa Lee Adams, Malia, Quincy Patterson Rickett, The Panda Den, Jade Turcott, Devin Dodd, Gianna Landrum, Alina Williams, or Eliana, I'm sorry, let us know, let us know, and Tracy Jacoby. Oh my God, thank you guys. And if we mess up your name, we're just so sorry. Um, Your name is beautiful, no matter how we said it. We're just two shits from Tennessee. We really are just two big old shits. (laughs) But thank you so very much. We love you. We love you. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. 